The words carried a weight that many in the scientific world had been waiting to hear for nearly half a century. NASA, long regarded as the global authority on planetary exploration, finally hinted at what many researchers have suspected since 1976, that life may once have existed on Mars. But why did it take so long for the agency to circle back to evidence first flagged during the Viking missions? And what does this admission say about the way scientific discoveries are controlled, shaped, and sometimes buried by institutional caution? The announcement, awkwardly wrapped in a press briefing that mixed factual missteps with bursts of genuine scientific revelation, has reopened questions that stretch back decades. Was the truth about life on Mars suppressed to avoid controversy? Did the global scientific establishment willfully overlook the work of pioneers like Dr. Gilbert Levin, whose labelled release experiment during Vikings mission appeared to detect active biological processes on the Martian surface? And perhaps most crucially, if life existed there billions of years ago, might some form of it still be clinging to survival beneath the red planet's scarred crust today? The press conference that reignited this discussion was notable for both its blunders and its breakthroughs. A senior NASA administrator misstated the size of the galaxy by orders of magnitude, while others leaned into political pleasantries and vague assurances. Yet buried in the noise was the undeniable core. Recent analyses of Martian rock formations uncovered by the Perseverance rover show patterns so strikingly similar to microbial signatures on Earth that non-biological explanations have all but collapsed. What scientists saw were leopard spot textures, iron and phosphate deposits, and clear traces of organic compounds locked within Jezero Crater's ancient sediments. In essence, the planet whispered its truth through stone and mineral, and the instruments designed to listen finally caught it. These features did not emerge in a vacuum. They were etched into the rock in what was once a river delta flowing into an expansive Martian lake billions of years ago. Earth at that same epoch was just beginning to nurture single-celled organisms in its oceans. Could the two planets, both once wet and geologically active, have run parallel in the earliest chapters of life's story? And if so, was the red planet's trajectory into desolation simply a preview of Earth's distant future, should climate and cosmic fate turn against it? For decades, NASA's public messaging has focused on the search for habitable environments, for water, for potential signs of life. Yet, when the Viking landers touched Martian soil in the mid-1970s, their instruments ran tests so conclusive that to this day no abiotic process has been able to replicate them. Levin's labelled release experiment introduced nutrient solutions into Martian regolith samples. What followed was unmistakable. The nutrients were consumed and carbon dioxide was released as a byproduct exactly the way microbial metabolism works. The tests were repeated with sterilization controls. When samples were superheated to kill any organisms, no reaction occurred. When partially sterilized, the results diminished but did not vanish. Both Viking 1 and Viking 2 reported positive detections, and yet NASA declared the results inconclusive. Why? At the time, the counter-argument suggested that unusual soil chemistry might mimic biological reactions. Perchlorates and radiation were mentioned as potential culprits. But later, laboratory tests never managed to reproduce the Viking findings using purely chemical pathways. Time and again, the evidence leaned toward the biological explanation, but the agency kept its official stance guarded, almost dismissive. The hesitancy is understandable at one level. To proclaim life beyond Earth in the 1970s would have been a cultural earthquake. Religious institutions, political powers and global scientific consensus might have struggled to absorb it. But was caution the only reason? Levin himself argued that his status as an outsider, less entrenched in NASA's hierarchy, made the agency reluctant to credit his discovery. Recognition, he believed, was denied not because of weak data, but because of institutional pride and fear of premature declaration. The resurfacing of this debate today is not just about rocks on Mars. It is about the credibility of science, the politics of discovery, and the public's right to truth. If NASA had stronger evidence than it admitted for decades, then the way history was written about life beyond Earth has been manipulated. 
And if life is indeed an ordinary outcome of chemistry, wherever water and organic compounds mingle, then humanity must face a universe teeming with biology, not a lonely cosmic desert. Perseverance's findings make this scenario more plausible than ever. In the rock named Chivaya Falls, scientists detected those strange leopard spot formations, each ringed by deposits that on Earth typically arise from microbial activity. Organic molecules were confirmed in multiple samples using the rover's Sherlock spectrometer. These molecules were not scattered randomly, but closely associated with the same regions of the rock that displayed textures consistent with microbial colonies. To argue that heat or volcanic flows might have created them fails against the absence of any volcanic evidence in Jezero Crater. Instead, all signs point to slow-moving water, nutrient-rich mud, and chemical processes indistinguishable from biology. This discovery forces a question that hangs like a shadow over the entire field of astrobiology. If similar conditions give rise to life in more than one place, is life inevitable whenever the recipe is present? Earth, with its oceans, sunlight and carbon chemistry, spawned microbes as soon as conditions stabilized. Mars, with rivers and lakes billions of years ago, appears to have followed the same script. If that is true, then the existence of life may not be a rare miracle, but a universal law. How then should humanity reframe its place in the cosmos? As the Perseverance rover drills, samples, and prepares for a potential return mission, some experts insist that the evidence is already sufficient. Others argue that only Earth-based laboratories equipped with the most advanced microscopes and analytical tools can deliver the final confirmation. But herein lies a new dilemma. Should samples from Mars be brought back directly to Earth, with unknown risks of contamination, or first processed in the safety of lunar orbit? The Lunar Gateway Station, still in development, was envisioned for precisely such purposes, yet whether NASA will follow through remains uncertain. The echoes of 1976 now thunder more loudly than ever. Levin's experiment, long dismissed, aligns eerily with what Perseverance is uncovering. If Mars was alive then, might it still harbour life today? Subsurface aquifers, shielded from radiation, could easily sustain extremophiles akin to Earth's resilient bacteria. Life on Earth has flourished in boiling vents, radioactive waste and icy permafrost. Why would Mars be different? The reluctance to acknowledge Levin's work reflects not only scientific conservatism but also a fear of consequence. To admit that life was detected decades ago is to confess that history's narrative has been altered by omission. It raises questions about how many other discoveries have been downplayed, delayed or quietly buried because they emerged at inconvenient times. Science prides itself on self-correction, but self-correction, delayed for generations, risks eroding trust. As one reflects on the rocky sediments of Jezero Crater, a deeper philosophical undercurrent emerges. If life forms whenever the conditions are right, then humanity is not exceptional but typical. Civilization's rise on Earth is not the climax of cosmic history, but one thread among countless others. Could entire civilizations have risen and fallen on distant worlds, their stories erased by time just as Mars lost its rivers and lakes? And if humanity fails to safeguard its own fragile biosphere, will Earth one day be studied by another intelligence as a planet where life once thrived and then vanished? The admission, awkward as it was, opens doors that can never be shut again. The leopard spots in Martian stone and the carbon dioxide exhalations of Viking soil samples together weave a narrative too coherent to ignore. Something lived on Mars. Something consumed, metabolized, and interacted with its environment in ways that match life as we know it. And if it happened there, it will happen elsewhere. The story of Gilbert Levin's labelled release experiment is more than a historical footnote. It has become the fulcrum upon which today's revelations pivot. His methodology was not radical, but elegantly simple. Add nutrients, wait for metabolism, measure the gases. On Earth, the same approach is used even now to check drinking water for harmful bacteria. False positives are virtually non-existent. Yet, when Levin's instruments delivered consistent positive results on two separate Viking landers, the official line was hesitation. That hesitation grew into silence, and eventually silence hardened into dismissal.
It is difficult to escape the suspicion that Levin's outsider status played as much of a role as scientific caution. NASA has always been a nexus of politics and prestige. Discoveries attributed to those within its core circles are celebrated, while findings from those less entrenched can be treated with skepticism bordering on hostility. To acknowledge Levin in 1976 would have meant reshaping textbooks overnight. It would also have meant confronting the philosophical weight of the first detection of extraterrestrial life. Perhaps humanity was not ready, or perhaps institutions feared losing control of the narrative. Fast forward nearly half a century. The Perseverance rover does not just echo Levin's findings, it amplifies them. The textures etched into Martian stone are nearly identical to microbial fossils on Earth. The organics are not incidental contaminants, but appear deeply integrated into mineral structures. The absence of volcanic or high heat events in Jezero Crater further eliminates non-biological explanations. Taken together, the case is stronger than ever before. The evidence is not anecdotal, not circumstantial, but layered and consistent. Yet still the announcement was delivered with timidity, couched in qualifiers and wrapped in bureaucratic restraint. But restraint cannot muffle the resonance of this discovery. If life has existed twice in one solar system, then the leap from chemistry to biology is no fluke. It is a natural progression. Water plus organics plus time equals life. This is the equation written into the cosmos. It means Europa's oceans beneath their icy crust are not sterile. It means Enceladus, with its geysers of water vapor laced with organic material, may already harbor microbial ecosystems. It means Titan's methane seas may host exotic biochemistries. The red planet may only be the first domino. Still, there is a danger in triumph. Finding life beyond Earth does not guarantee survival for life on Earth. Mars itself is a warning. Once it had rivers, lakes, perhaps even oceans. Today it is an arid desert, its atmosphere stripped by solar winds after its magnetic field collapsed. Climate change on Mars was not driven by industry or recklessness, it was the outcome of planetary physics. Earth, by contrast, is destabilizing through its own species' actions. If life can wither on Mars, it can wither here. The discovery forces humanity to ask whether it is willing to repeat the mistakes of planetary neglect, only this time as an active agent of its own decline. So what now? The narrative will continue to evolve as Perseverance gathers more data, as international missions prepare to contribute their own findings, and as debates over sample return intensify. But regardless of the path forward, one fact can no longer be avoided. Mars has whispered its secret, and the world has finally begun to listen. For those who have followed the search for life with curiosity and passion, the moment is both vindicating and bittersweet. Vindicating, because the evidence is now too strong to ignore. Bittersweet, because recognition has come decades too late for the pioneers who risked reputation to speak what they saw. Science advances, but not always at the speed of discovery. Sometimes it crawls, hampered by politics, pride and fear. And yet, here humanity stands, at the threshold of confirming it is not alone. A second genesis has been detected within the same solar system. That is not coincidence, that is inevitability. The universe, it seems, is not indifferent to life. It breeds it, shelters it, extinguishes it, and begins again. The real question is not whether life exists elsewhere, but how far it has already gone. If microbes on Mars are real, then why not forests on distant exoplanets? Why not civilizations beyond the faint glow of our instruments? The red planet has served as mirror and muse for centuries, a canvas upon which humanity projected its hopes and fears. Now it has become something else, a testament, a testament that life, given even a fraction of opportunity, will emerge. A testament that the universe is more alive than dead. A testament that the greatest discovery of all may have been sitting in plain sight since 1976. And so, as scientists argue, as agencies manoeuvre, as politics stumble over themselves, the truth remains written in Martian stone and Viking data. Life has touched two worlds. That is no longer speculation, but revelation. For those watching, the choice is clear. 
This story is too important to vanish into archives, too vital to be drowned out by bureaucratic restraint. Spread it, share it, discuss it, challenge it, and above all, keep the pressure on for answers, because the cosmos has already given one. So if you believe the truth deserves light, if you believe that discoveries belong not to institutions, but to all of humanity, then don't just read this act. Like share, subscribe and tap that hype icon so this revelation reaches the widest audience possible. The Red Planet has spoken. The question now is whether humanity is finally ready to listen.